Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the best YouTuber of them all? Why, it is none other than you, Evan the Power Bower. Oh, that's weird. Let me try again. Mirror, mirror on the wall, what gaming console has the worst controller of them all? Why, of course, it has to be the Nintendo GameCube. Oh yeah, this thing is definitely broken. We all love video games. At least, I think we all do, and if you don't, then why the hell did you click on this video? Gaming has come a long way from the early days of the Atari with simple single button games, all the way to these grand, high definition adventures you can experience on your refrigerator. All of these games can take years to make with an incredible story and graphics, but if it's not put on a console that can fully take advantage of the experience, then who gives a sh**? So many things go into making a console between its specs, the size, the controller, the library of games, and of course the name. And that's the part where some companies seem to get it wrong. Sony stole PlayStation from Nintendo and has run with it ever since, which I have no problem with since it's a great console name. Microsoft, on the other hand, went from Xbox to Xbox 360, then back to Xbox One, then made variations of it called Xbox One S and Xbox One X, and now they're going on to the Xbox Series X. This might be worse than Nintendo deciding to name their console the Wii U, which is a sentence I thought I might never say. And speaking of Nintendo, they seem to be the one major developer who isn't afraid to change the name of their system. Well, besides Sega, but we all know what happened to them. Nintendo has had such creative names that represent their consoles perfectly. The Wii was meant to bring people together. The Switch can switch between handheld and home consoles. The Nintendo 64 had 64 bits. And the Wii U made the sound of the ambulance you'd hear after shooting yourself from playing it. But, do you know what console had the best name that literally perfectly described it? That would be none other than what I believe to be the most underrated console of all time, the cubicle, Nintendo GameCube. The idea for the GameCube started back around 1997 to 98 when the concept for a new graphics processor was developed under the codename Flipper, which makes a lot of sense when you know that the codename for the whole console was Dolphin. It was a big leap for Nintendo, being the first console of theirs to use discs instead of the classic cartridges, even though the discs are only like half the size of normal. But that was so the console could focus more on gaming and less on any outside mediums like playing CDs. The GameCube was first announced at a press conference in Japan on August 25th, 2000, and the launch titles were announced at the following E3, with with games like Luigi's Mansion, Rogue Squadron 2, and this shit. Several launch titles were pushed back, including games like Melee, and this was the first Nintendo console to not feature a Super Mario platformer at launch. Which to me feels like a perfect beginning to this era of new ideas and change Nintendo went through with the GameCube. And before we really dive into the GameCube, I quickly want to mention that apparently long before the console's release, Nintendo actually developed an early prototype for motion controls for the system. The controller reportedly had a microphone and headphone jacks, which just seems super unnecessary, but I will never question God Nintendo. These motion controls were obviously scrapped and reworked into the GameCube's successor, the Wii. But I just think it's so cool to see that Nintendo was so far ahead in the motion control movement that they were developing controllers for it all the way back in the late 90s. Nintendo is always so far ahead of the game with great ideas. Never mind. The GameCube was officially launched in Japan on September 14th, 2001, with a release two months later in North America and then following suit in Europe in 2002. The system was met with generally positive reviews, with fairly impressive hardware and an even more impressive startup screen. Oh, f that's good. But as I always say, a console is only as good as its games, and the launch titles of the GameCube were a bit of a mixed bag. There were some weird ass games like Crazy Taxi, but then hidden gems like Super Monkey Ball. But the big title that was marketed heavily at launch, like I mentioned earlier, was Luigi's Mansion. Nintendo always launches their home console with a big mainline title from one of their biggest IPs, like Super Mario 64, or Breath of the Wild, or the same game for the fourth time in four years. Nintendo always knows what they're doing. Luigi's Mansion is easily the most unique and straight up weirdest title Nintendo has ever chosen to launch a console with. Everyone wanted Luigi to finally get out of Mario's shadow, but I don't think anyone would have guessed he would end up trying to save Mario from a painting by sucking ghosts up with a vacuum given to him by a creepy old man. Yet somehow this makes sense. And you know what makes the game even more perfect as a launch title? It uses the GameCube controller to its full potential honestly better than so many of the games on the system. And this game ended up being so popular that it began its own franchise with now two more games in the series, basically with the same concept as the first game though. You'd think after the first two games, Mario would ask Luigi why he keeps entering these clearly fake mansion contests. But of course Luigi would then respond with, It's free real estate.
Easily the biggest selling point for the GameCube was the incredible controller that to this day is still my very favorite. They took everything from the N64 controller and made it at least 50 times better. They made the controller the most ergonomical and comfortable piece of plastic I have ever seen and got rid of that weird third shaft on the N64. I still have no idea why they made this thing the most confusing controller to use, or did they just market it towards aliens? That might be more likely than thinking this was a good idea for humans. They also added some rubber to the control stick so the kids stopped cutting holes in their hands, but that's probably just so they didn't get into another lawsuit. The buttons were also shifted around to make a lot more sense with some new buttons like the X and Y buttons. Some of the buttons on the N64 controller were literally impossible to use if you hold it the intended way. How the hell am I supposed to use the D-pad or press the L button with this damn thing? But the GameCube made it so much easier by getting rid of that third slong and moving the D-pad down which I really don't know how it took them that long to figure it out. However, all of those pale in comparison to the two biggest changes with the trigger buttons and the C-stick. These were exactly what I was referring to when I said Luigi's Mansion took full advantage of the system. Instead of just normal shoulder buttons like the N64 had, these triggers had some sort of weird voodoo powers that could determine exactly how hard you pressed the button and the game could respond accurately. Luigi's Mansion used this by the vacuum sucking in accordance to how hard you push the trigger, which is such an unnecessary touch, but makes the experience so much more enjoyable. Because, let's be honest, most people would wouldn't notice it even had any effect, but just the fact that the developers went the extra mile shows how much they really cared, and the C-Stick gave you full range of control over your character by being able to move, turn, and suck all at the same time. So basically like any Kirby game, just being able to freely turn or move the camera without those stupid C buttons is something that forever should be cherished. This controller is just perfect, and I think I might love it more than my own dog. My dog might be cuter, but I mean, he doesn't have magic voodoo trigger, so that's on him. Sorry, Romeo. But you know what makes the GameCube even better? More than just one game used the controller's functions to their fullest potential in a way that didn't feel forced. Just as Luigi uses the Poltergust 3000, Mario uses his own weird backpack with a flash liquidizing ultra dowsing device also known as Flood. Not only does Flood look like me after a few two shots or eating too much Taco Bell, but he also uses the same trigger technology to accurately spray water. Flood will spray more water depending on how hard you press the trigger which makes perfect sense because Mario was squeezing the handles to spray the water. This might be the most accurate depiction of trigger technology because it really feels like you are controlling Flood with way more precision than a single button. It is such a minor and minute detail, but it makes the experience so much better. And not only did multiple games use the triggers amazingly, but the C-Stick changed the way Nintendo created 3D and 2D games forever. Just take a look at Super Smash Bros. Melee. Not only was it arguably the best fighting game ever created, but it also incorporated the C-Stick to perform more powerful smash attacks that used to only be able to be done by pressing A and a direction at the same time. Sure, most people think of it as just an excuse to spam those attacks, and they're right, but it does make attacking so much easier for less experienced players. Although, let's be real, any newcomer would just get bodied by a veteran in Melee. But it's the thought by the developers that counts. Melee was also the first game in the series to really expand and change the franchise for future games moving forward, which is just the epitome of the GameCube experience. The original just let you battle alone, with friends, or complete classic mode, and that was basically more or less it. Melee added tons of new little modes like the Home Run Derby and the much more major additions of the Event Matches and the Adventure Mode. Event matches give you tons of new challenges to complete in a battle setting to give you hours of fun because some of these can be quite difficult. While Adventure Mode added a sort of story aspect to the game with stages based on different characters from the game and tons of unique battles. It's not as in-depth as Subspace Emissary, but it set the groundwork so it deserves credit for that. And we can't talk about changes Melee made without bringing up the trophies. These are the most pointless and unnecessary addition to any fighting game to ever exist, but I'd be lying if I said they weren't the best part of the entire game. There's something so mesmerizing about collecting these trophies from so many different franchises with the descriptions that they come with. It's like collecting amiibos, but less expensive, less time consuming, and just better all around. And last but not least, Melee was the first game to give us some characters that nobody knew about at the time. I mean, the original did give us Ness and Captain Falcon who were a bit out their choices, but that's not even close to Marth and Roy whose games hadn't even come to the West at the time. Also Mr. Game & Watch. What? I know most of you are probably shocked that I haven't even mentioned my favorite video game series of all time up until now, but don't worry, we're about to get into that. The Legend of Zelda was coming off one of the most revolutionary games of all time and the most creative game in the series to date. That accompanied with the Space World 2000 demo of Link and Ganondorf fighting, everyone was just waiting to see what dark and action-filled Zelda game we could finally experience on the more powerful Nintendo GameCube console. And what did we get? Oh.
Wind Waker was not met with universal love like some of the games before it, but that honestly is just the GameCube as a whole. Neither Sunshine nor Luigi's Mansion were either, which I just think is a testament to people hating change or not getting exactly what they want. Everyone wanted a Super Mario 64 clone, but we got this. And everyone wanted an Ocarina of Time clone, but we got this. However, even though the game looks completely different, the gameplay is basically exactly the same as Ocarina of Time but with more personality and a more vibrantly colored world. Ocarina of Time was obviously the more revolutionary game, but in terms of gameplay and just overall quality of life, Wind Waker takes the cake. Although I do feel like this is just another example of the C-Stick being such a useful tool because I'm not gonna lie. Turning the camera in Ocarina of Time was annoying as hell. In fact, all 3D cameras on the N64 were pretty dog shit, but what can you expect from Nintendo's first real 3D console? Being able to control the camera in a 3D Zelda game might be the most underrated change they've ever made, even more underrated than motion controls. Please don't argue with me about that, it was a joke. And the cell shading art style they went for still holds up to this day and might be the most beautiful looking Zelda game as well, especially after the remake. Nintendo definitely made the right choice by pissing off every fan who wanted a Dark Zelda game, especially since they still got it a few years later with Twilight Princess, which I could argue is one of the most unique Zelda games too. Between the dark story, crazy twist villain, and being able to turn into a wolf easily makes this game stand out from the rest. Also, Midna? Zelda games might have peaked on the GameCube if we're being honest until the Wii. The best way that I can describe the GameCube is just the era of change and just trying weird, wacky, out of left field ideas nobody expected. Every game I have mentioned up to this point has been some sort of deviation on its franchise and none of them are really that popular at their time of release, but that's just perfect for this console as a whole. This is the most evident with the big, popular, and famous titles, but even the small games from relatively big franchises were super unique and don't get nearly as much recognition as they deserve. Kirby Air Ride is not even close to a normal Kirby game, yet they made the most unique racing game to possibly ever exist. Star Fox Adventures still has aspects from the classic spaceship games, but implements much more adventure gameplay to essentially make the game Zelda but for furries. Metroid came back from the dead after skipping the N64 with, in my opinion, the greatest Metroid game of all time, Metroid Prime. Basically doing the same thing as Ocarina of Time by turning a 2D adventure into a grand 3D masterpiece. Also Echoes, but eh. Pokemon Coliseum was technically the first ever 3D adventure because all Stadium 1 and 2 had were minigames with a side mode for battling, and Pokemon Snap was just capturing pictures but Coliseum had an entire story which, we'll get to that another time. Four Swords Adventures was the first fully multiplayer Zelda game and used such a cool feature by letting you use the Game Boy Advance as a controller to get you switched between two screens without interfering with the other players. Sort of like a less shitty and less gimmicky Wii U. But more importantly than all those games, the GameCube gave what I believe to be the best Mario Kart to ever exist with Double Dash. Throughout my life, I probably have played 64 the most, but that's just because I grew up with that console. Double Dash is easily peak Mario Kart with by far the most creative idea by letting you select two racers in one cart. You could play multiplayer with two actual humans with one cart, and you could even have up to 16 players through the GameCube's LAN adapters, which I just feel like most people don't actually know about. This was the first game in the series to really change the formula with a completely new way to play, and even the new battle modes might be the best part of the entire game too. And I just like to look at the weird combo you can make. Never in my life would I think that these two could actually be partners, yet here we are. The GameCube might not be the most revolutionary console of all time, but that doesn't take away for how amazing for its time it really was. It gave us unique titles for every major franchise, finally gave us rounded edges, and I will always stand by the fact that it is the most underrated console of all time. Every game from top to bottom on this console was incredible in its own right, either from changing the mold of an entire franchise, starting an entirely new franchise on its own, or just being weird as fuck, there's something for everyone on the GameCube. Sure, it wasn't the most powerful console, or the most revolutionary, or have the best graphics, but what it does have is the most accurate name and best controller, so what else do you need? Nintendo loves to make one console and then make an improved version just a few years down the line. The Super Nintendo was just a better NES, the GameCube is essentially just a better Nintendo 64, and the Wii U tried, I just can't wait to see what Nintendo does for a new and improved Switch. I don't know how much they can improve upon it besides improving the graphics and the battery life, but they better at least give it a cool name, like Nintendo Change Up or Nintendo Switcheroo, although we all know what they'd end up doing. I cannot wait for the new Nintendo Switch U Deluxe. But with all the drawbacks the GameCube has over the other consoles, there is always one thing that will make the GameCube stand head and shoulders above the rest, and that's the handle on this damn thing. Just look at it! I couldn't do this with any other console.